I definitely say that. <laughs> it took the first couple of years working here before I started realizing everything that I owned didn't quite sound quite as good as it used to anymore. And, and I'd come back to the air system and listen to that. And you, you realize you feel more with the music when you have a system that really has that extra piece that uh, isn't really in the mass marketing system or mass market systems that you hear. So I have a, uh, an Air QX520 as the uh, digital source, um, an AX520 as the, pre the integrated amplifier, They're running a pair of Martin Logan Summit speakers. And then I'm using a um, P5 as my phono preamp and a Wilson Binish uh, full circle turntable with their tone arm. I've got a, a, a DX5, one of our universal Blu-ray disc spinners, and then an EX8 and then some, some old um, Charlie designed Avalon Eclipse speakers. I have the codex on my computer at home and I listen to that quite often. And then the current system that I have is the EX8 connected to some Vanderstein uh, 3As. It's a great question. Actually, one of the things that we had talked about, um, it was kind of a, a reevaluation phase for air. And that was after Charlie had passed. We really needed to, uh, kind of decide what we were gonna do that would make the company ours. So air is driven today by you know the, the employees. It's not one person making all the decisions for the company anymore. And we get together and we talk about what is the next best steps and work together to do that. One of the places we looked at was the advertising and the way that it's approached. And we realized that uh, in the audio industry, there's a pretty low bar to me, you know, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's pretty strange to me. The social media was, was one of those, where can we get the most effective bang for the dollar, so to speak, you know, posting on a, a Facebook and Twitter and things like that. Those are easy things to do. They're fun for us to do as well. So one of the most brilliant things that uh, uh, was the idea that Brent kind of came up with here was the Pints with Air series that we're doing now. And uh, it really kind of scratched an itch, so to speak, that I had with uh, even this industry as a whole, you know, this Pints with Air series really allowed us to start doing that in a really organic way that breaks it apart and talks about what we do. And that's, that's been really cool for us. A lot of it's just picking a topic, um, whether it's a specific air topic or if it's an audio topic or an industry topic. And we'll just talk about that and kind of go through our analysis and our thoughts on it and cover different aspects of our world. The QX5 was our, you know, was our first, you know, really multi-input DAC. So uh, the only DAC we've done before that was the QB9, which was just a USB only input. And so the QX5 was the first foray into, a, you know, a full featured uh, DAC. So it has uh, the array of SPDIF inputs, a USB, as well as streaming network inputs. And so we put it into our, you know, our X5 lineup. I mean, the way we implemented it really could have been a high, you know, a higher line. We threw almost everything we knew at it as far as circuit board materials, parts, parts quality, circuit board stack up technology, you name it. We, we threw everything that we knew how to do at the time. Uh, we, we, we developed, um, in cooperation with uh, Morian Crystals, uh, developed a custom uh, crystal oscillator that hadn't really been done before to, to, to retain, you know, ultra, ultra low levels of jitter. That was the, the debut of the ESS 9038 Pro chip. We were the first one to actually come, come to market with that. Most DAC chips come with many, many features, various digital filters and digital filter options, various ASRC functions and jitter reduction and you name it. Um, and so uh, the way we use DAC chips, we try to use it solely as a DAC chip. We try to disable or bypass any of those, those features. We do our own digital filters external to the DAC chip. We don't use any ASRC. We always use either asynchronous or actual synchronous digital audio. That's how we believe that we get the best performance out of them and the best sound out of them by using them just as a DAC chip as much as possible. You know, one of the things we liked about the QX5 was it was kind of an all-in-one digital kind of hub. So you could have multiple digital sources all feeding into one place. This is 
more or less an extension on that in the sense of, you know, you can have now one piece that fulfills many roles in your system without having to have several other boxes. And, you know, there's definitely situations where whether it be real estate for your, your apartments, price consciousness or whatnot, where you wouldn't want to do that. But EX8 is kind of an all one standalone system. You can stream into it from your phone. You can feed it USB from your computers. You can, you know, plug uh, your TV system into it if you want it to be your home stereo system for your, for your, um, your television while you're watching movies or, you know, plug in a CD player into it. Uh, you know, any of those things can be done with that EX8 and then you have your integrated amplifier um, all right there in that one box. Yeah, so it's, it's that whole X8 product lineup, it, it, you know, it's really, you know, intended to, to bring a lot of that performance down to a more affordable price. The measurements are kind of guidelines, but that's not our, the ultimate threshold. We use them to make sure that we're on the right path. We, we use them to make sure that we are, you know, um, particularly as we're making revisions to, to a design, we're making sure that we um, are kind of on the right path. But in the end, what sounds better is what trumps um, measurements. There's 30 years worth of history we have of taking those measurements and building on it. So mm -hmm. we can use them more as a guideline now than say in 1994 when we were first developing things, even though I, you know, I'm sure Charlie took a lot of that same approach then, but ma making sure that things measured properly when we're developing those first technologies is more important than it is now that we have that track record. Starting the speakers, we have some TAD reference ones mm -hmm. um, that we've had for uh, probably more than a decade now. They're truly full range. They're truly coherent. They're really quite pistonic. So they're, we believe to be um, a, a, a really valid reference speaker. The rest of the components are somewhat um, fluid, but uh, you know, generally we'll have a pair of our reference amps, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, MXRs, and then our KXR preamplifier. And then depending on what we're listening to, everything else kind of changes. And we have an HRS rack that we mount everything on, and, and then a separate HRS rack stand, both for the power amps and all the, on the source equipment. We use our own, um, we call it L5 uh, power line conditioner for a turntable. Uh, we have a DPS turntable from Germany. For disc spinning, we usually have a DX5, um, a universal transport in there. We strongly believe in providing a piece of gear that isn't flashy or anything, but it mimics what a live performance is supposed to sound like as closely as possible. That's always our goal. You know, so we don't do fancy, you know, beef up the bass to make it more bassier than it was and or things like that we just try to we try to replicate and you know from there the consumer can make their own decisions on the newer aspects of things you know we're, we're looking more at systems that are more affordable you know one of the conversations charlie and i had uh near the end of his life was you know we as many manufacturers in this industry have done is we got subject to what i call price creep so make a $10,000 amplifier, it's easy to make a $15,000 amplifier. And it's easy to make a $25,000 amplifier because you just keep adding technologies onto it. Charlie and I sat down at one point and I said, Charlie, I go, when did we become a manufacturer that only wants to sell to the people that are able to afford these ultra expensive pr products? And he said, you're absolutely right. And that was, that was, you know, not long before he had passed on and it kind of really kind of reoriented us to saying, you know, we need to look at Get, you know, focusing on things like the eight series and, you know, other products even, you know, that are going to be more affordable in the future to open up the line, so to speak. It's not that we don't want to continue making the best sounding stuff in the world that we do. Um, you know, we still want to have that emphasis as well. But we also want to make sure that we're reaching more audiences and letting people that want to get into this industry have an affordable way to be able to do that. I'm excited because we're a young company and we've got, you know, we're open to a lot of new ideas and, there's, uh, you know, we get to talk about a lot of crazy things. You know, we have crazy idea day. I'm just going to make something up because it's not out of, out of bounds, like something that could be pulled out of your car and carried into your house and continue playing on an air system, whatever. Like there's, there's all kinds of things that you can come up with, but just doing that, just the practice of doing that every once in a while you come up with something you're like, Hey, that, that could actually be something we could do and cool.
It's exciting that there is like this new generation coming into our industry. That's one of the things that really gives me hope for our industry overall. You know, like you've talked about Zoo and shit, and there's, you know, there's a, there's a good handful of, of companies that, that are looking at this, you know, differently than it has been, or, or maybe actually it's in the way it was, it was originally looked in back in the late sixties, you know, when high end was a new industry and it's kind of a fresh take on that rather than, you know, coming out of the the nineties and early two thousands when it had changed a lot. There's been a lot of like trying to figure out how to get the most amount of money out of a aging market. You know, it's a, it's a, Mm -hmm. it's an aging shrinking, so to speak market in that regard. And not a lot of thought has been put into, well, what happens in the next 20 years? You know, how do we, how do we keep selling products in the next 20 years? And how do we bring new people into this industry that's going to want to, you know, make this their hobby and make this their focus? It's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you. No, uh, the next product uh, coming out here is going to be a new disc spinner for us, the CX-8 which is going to continue on the 8 Series line um, after the EX8 and the QX8. It'll be a CD player. It's going to have the uh, capabilities of having Ethernet streaming on it on board, as well as a USB back on board. So um, we can do those uh, three things for you. And then uh, we'll have the analog outputs, of course, as well as digital outputs. (laughs) (laughs) That was awesome.